Uh, if demands were made, most of the time, mm -hmm. the women or the actor acquiesced to whatever those were. And, um, but there was nobody, even if you didn't want to do that, if it would, as was with me, there was no one that I could go to to say, this is what is happening and it's wrong. Greetings, guests. Welcome to The Patriarchy, where we explore cinema classics fueled by predictive Hollywood programming and unpack how our favorite characters in cinema got egg all over their faces. I am your commentator, Dom, and tonight we're unpacking real-life terror on the big screen behind the scenes. I'm very confused. I just need a chance to think things over. This topic is not the normal lighthearted plot review, as today we aren't talking about movie plots and the depiction of patriarchal themes on screen. We are talking about the controversies and the sinister and wicked treatment of women behind the scenes, and how this behavior largely went unchecked while the directors behind the trauma went on to have long, successful, and unaffected careers. The Last Tangle in Paris was a highly controversial film back in the 1970s, yet still grossed over $36 million upon its release in the United States, making it the seventh highest grossing film of 1973, beating out James Bond, Live and Let Die that year. The number one film was The Exorcist. And this isn't a bad return considering the film's $1 million budget. This movie is about a recent middle-aged widower and American expat, Paul, who meets a young and vibrant Parisian woman, Jeanne, while trying to rent an apartment. And the two enter into an undisclosed sexual exchange that Paul initially wishes to keep completely anonymous. He doesn't want to know anything personal about her, not even her name. And after stringing this young woman along through all sorts of abuse, towards the end of the film, he chases her down, professing his love for her before she shoots him. Now that we've got our memories jogged on the plot, we are actually not here to talk about the plot. And I honestly couldn't give this plot a fair analysis as I've only seen this movie once and that was one too many times for me. We are here to talk about the terrible plotting that went down behind the scenes. That in this weirdly twisted misogynistic time, garnered these perpetrators nominations for two Academy Awards, Best Director and Best Actor. Maria, don't worry, it's just a movie. This was the response uttered by 48-year-old Marlon Brando just before he, as a co-conspirator, added a very invasive and lewd scene in which 19-year-old actress Maria Schneider would be raped on screen using a stick of butter as lubricant. Ça va pas, des problèmes, hein? There's some butter in the kitchen. So you're here. What did you answer? Who left the butter? This last minute added scene was concocted from the sick imaginations of the director Bernardo Bertolucci, 31 at the time, and 48-year-old actor Marlon Brando, all unbeknownst to the 19-year-old actress Miss Maria Schneider. And why was this? Why didn't they let Maria in on what was about to go down? Because the director quote-unquote wanted her reaction as a girl, not as an actress. Maria Schneider, um, she was 19 at the time, uh, time when the film was um, uh, recorded and um, it was apparently such a strong role for her and made such an impact on the audience that she always uh, was connected to Last Tango in Paris. This is what she had to say about it. And I was uh, incredibly sad. After the movie we really didn't see each other because she was hating me. Uh, the scene you have just... Why did she hate you? Uh, the scene that you have just seen before, uh, which is uh, called uh, the scene sequence of the butter. Uh, it's an idea that I had with Marlon in the morning before, um, uh, before shooting it. It was uh, in the scape that he had to rape her in a way. And uh, we were having, uh, with Marlon, a breakfast on the floor of the flat. And we looked at each other. 
and without saying anything, we knew what we wanted. <laughs> and uh, but uh, but I've been in a way horrible thing that she hated me and also Marlon because we didn't tell her that uh, there was this that detail of uh, the butter used as a lubricant. Um, and uh, I still feel very guilty for that. Do you regret the fact that you have shot the scene like you did? No, but I feel guilty. I feel guilty, but I do not regret. Bertolucci and Brando wanted her to be humiliated on camera. They wanted to violate her and they wanted to capture this raw and vulnerable emotion all on screen. You know, to make movies sometime, to obtain something, I think that uh, you have to be completely free. Uh, I didn't want Maria to act her humiliation, her rage. I wanted Maria to feel, not to act, the rage and the humiliation. Then she hated me for all life. Sick, right? All for the sake of art, the cinema, and to them, the end justified the means. And they succeeded. She was terribly humiliated. And unfortunately, it was Maria's reputation that took a major hit. And this public perception of her and the abuse that she suffered on set would cause her to spiral into heavy drug use while her assailants would go on to be nominated for Academy Awards. The film made her well known, but at the same time, it was a real curse for her. It was a curse because she felt and abused, and at the same time, she was seen as dirty by the public. The film was banned in many countries, and she was never able to shake that image. And after the film release and the scandal that followed, she fell into drugs, heroin in a very bad way, and those years were terrible for her. She had a lot of trouble coming back from that. In fact, Bertolucci and Brando would go on to be nominated and win several awards while Maria Schneider was recognized by only one organization for her performance, an Italian organization titled the David Di Donatello Awards, which I read is like the Italian equivalent to the Academy Awards. Maria won the Special David Award, not even Best Actress, but I guess now we all know that she wasn't acting. This level of torment is absolutely repulsive and 50 years later all sorts of Hollywood elites would come out denouncing this formidable behavior, but we all know that that is just 50 years too late. We're killing ourselves out here and you're going to be ready. I am too, I'm standing right by the door. Can we play mood music? No, I can't Yeah, but when you came out like this, you said it is. We're sitting there because they say, wait a minute, and then you say on the radio, But when you do it, you've got to look desperate, Shelley. You're just wasting everybody's time now. I did a review of The Shining last Halloween, and you can watch that here if you haven't seen it already. And everyone should know the plot of this famous horror flick that took place at the Overlook Hotel about a man who went mad and tried to murder his entire family. You think maybe he should be taken to a doctor? When do you think maybe he should be taken to a doctor? As soon as possible! As soon as possible! But it's not often discussed the terror that Shelley Duvall went through behind the filming of what would become a Halloween horror classic. I'm very confused. I just need a chance to think things over. Scenes that took days and weeks to shoot. 137 takes of Shelley screaming and crying. Can you imagine that? constant distress, so much so that clumps of her hair began falling out during filming. What we watch on screen is no longer acting. That's really her emotional state. And this isn't how Kubrick was with everybody. He didn't show Jack Nicholson this level of disrespect and disregard. It was just Shelley. The stress of the role was so great. From May until October, I was really in and out of ill health. I mean, he was a completely different director with Shelley. You always dislike whatever the cause is of pain. So I resented Stanley at times because he pushed me and it, it hurt. I thought, why do you want to do this to me? How can you do this to me? 
According to Angelica Houston, who was dating Jack Nicholson at the time, she quote unquote got the feeling through what Jack was telling her that Shelly was having a hard time dealing with the emotional content of the piece and that they didn't seem to be all that sympathetic. It seemed to be a little bit like the boys were ganging up. When I saw her during those days, she seemed generally a bit tormented, shook up. I don't think anyone was being particularly careful of her. Here's an interview of Shelley describing her experience under Kubrick's thumb. For a person so charming and, and so likable, indeed lovable, uh, he can do some pretty cruel things when you're filming. Because it seemed to me at times that the end justified the means. It was a very difficult goal. It was a long shoot, and I had to cry and hyperventilate and carry a little boy and run, you know, for most of the time we shot. And that was about a year, a little over a year. And anywhere between 30 and 50 videotaped rehearsals before we even rolled film. It was such intense work that I think it makes you smarter, but I wouldn't want to go through it again. And after all of this, guess what she got for her distress? Nominated Worst Actress for a Razzie Award. But again, Shelley wasn't acting. That was real life. It is the worst thing to be the object of someone's obsession if you're not interested. It became unbearable. Did Alfred Hitchcock try to have sex with you? Well, uh, he never got that far. I stopped it immediately. Hitchcock retaliated, she says, with pure cruelty. He replaced mechanical birds with real ones in that famous attack scene from The Birds. That's not fake blood. She really was pecked in the face by the birds. He told me he'd ruin my career. I said, do what you have to do. The Birds, directed by famed master of suspense Alfred Hitchcock, came out in 1963 and is another one of his titles that was inspired by Daphne du Maurier. See my review of Rebecca here. And this classic Hitchcock picture is about a small town in Northern California that is attacked and under siege by a massive flock of strange and vulturous birds. But let's talk about how Hitchcock made his leading actress, at the time 33-year-old Tippi Hendren, life a living hell after she declined to sleep with him during filming. Tippi, if you, if you would give them just a little précis, not from my lips but from yours, um, about when the hardships started during the making of The Birds in 1962. You know, The Birds took six months to film. And uh, it wasn't until the very ending of, of the filming that um, I started noticing that um, uh, he kept watching me, staring at me. And uh, whether we were on the set or whatever, he'd be standing off talking to people, carrying on a conversation and staring at me. Eventually that becomes um, um, almost like stalking, and uh, it was a very uncomfortable situation, and um, uh, I became very, very good at getting out. And while he tried to ruin her, we can end this episode on a positive note, knowing that Tippy went on to have a very long-standing career in both movies and television well into her 80s, receiving 40-plus honors and awards for her work throughout her lifetime. And what we can all learn from Tippy is that, ladies, it pays to stand your ground. Situation of it always being okay, whatever the director wanted from his actors, uh, be they male or female or whatever. Uh, if demands were made, most of the time, the women or the actor acquiesced to whatever those were. And, um, but there was nobody, even if you didn't want to do that, if it would, as was with me, there was no one that I could go to to say, this is what is happening and it's wrong. There was nobody to go to. Today, if this happened to me, I'd be a very rich woman. <laughs> 
signing off now, your friend Dom. <laughs>